Welcome EMS students to the physiology video lecture. The importance about the physiology is to understand how then the body works and in order for it to work we need to have energy production. This energy comes from the cell using oxygen and glucose and the mitochondria here creates the energy that the cell needs to maintain its function, its shape. It is needed for these cells if they are specialized for a specific tissue, the tissue to become an organ, these organs to work in unison and the body system. And without oxygen, we have a lack of energy production leading to um, an anaerobic state. In the anaerobic state, we have glucose, but as a result of the lack of oxygen, the mitochondria is no longer able to create enough energy for the cell to function. As a result of that, we develop an acid. Now these acids end up becoming very problematic. It's a poison, if you will. And we'll learn that if you have a lot of these poisons, it starts to wear on the body. Now remember that if the cell doesn't have enough energy to perform its function or to maintain its shape, these cells will start to die. That means that these cells that made up this special tissue will start to degrade and, and no longer function, die. Those tissues that became organs, that organ has dysfunction and no longer works together in unison with other organs and so the system the human body starts to fail and die and so it's important that we have both oxygen and our glucose in order to create this energy one function that requires this ATP is what's called the sodium potassium pump this types tries to regulate the two primary uh, ions within the cell and in the bloodstream here. So we have a lot of potassium in the cell and a lot of sodium outside and we want to make sure that they're in what looks like an equilibrium. So if you can imagine a seesaw, these are supposed to be in these types of containers. So they're one supposed to be inside the cell, one supposed to be outside the cell, and we keep this in an equilibrium or balance or what's called homeostasis. And the sodium potassium pump requires that energy in order to maintain that function. Again, if we have anaerobic, without oxygen uh, metabolism, that function can no longer work. And not only the poisons, but this imbalance, if you will, affects the way that the body works, which will cause the cell to lose its integrity and then rupture and release its internal contents. Now, when it releases its internal contents, it's causing an unequal, if you will, balance. So then the seesaw tends to change, and it's a detriment to the body's um, mechanics, body system function. So the lack of energy here, the sodium potassium pump, unable to maintain the balance or homeostasis, causes the cell to lose its function and it dies. Those cells tend to degrade, the tissues no longer support themselves, those tissues as an organ no longer function correctly, those organs no longer work in a system, and the body shuts down. Here we're showing you just a breakdown of oxygen that's in the air. We know that the human body doesn't use all of this oxygen, but in times when we really need it for our aerobic metabolism, it really is required that we have that oxygen. In order for oxygen to enter into the bloodstream, it has to go through an intact respiratory uh, center and anatomy. So here we're reviewing that, you know, in the upper airway passageway, Air is warmed, humidified, and filtered. It goes down through the windpipe or trachea, goes into the right and left uh, mainstem bronchus, down through the additional 
segments and down into the bronchioles and then across to the alveoli. In breathing, we may have additional muscles, the, uh, <clears throat> the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm uh, is the primary motor muscle for the respiratory tract as it allows when it contracts, it allows air to come in to the thoracic cage and lungs and as it relaxes, it decreases the volume and causes the air to be expelled out into the atmosphere. Those lungs have to remain inflated, again, the pleural space on the, vers uh, the visceral and parietal pleura needs to be, uh, in the integrity needs to be intact. And here they're just showing you the different pressures from atmospheric pressure and then internal pressure. So when the internal pressure in the lungs decrease and the diaphragm contracts, air is easily able to be inhaled. And when the diaphragm relaxes and it pushes back up, it brings that pressure up, allows the air to be expelled. We also have respiratory centers within the brainstem. This is our pneumotaxic and apneustic centers that allow for more controlled breathing so that we have a regular rate and rhythm to our breathing. It also tells us when to stop. So apneustic gives us the ability to when we need to take a breath and then our um, pneumotaxic center tells us, hey, you know, uh, it's time to exhale. So these are finely controlled so that our rate increases over time when we have exertion. Ventilation would not be able to carry the oxygen down to the, the cell and the tissues and organs if it were not for an intact circulatory system so we need to make sure that the heart is functioning as well as those conduits, the arteries, the arterioles, the capillaries, the venules and veins, that they are intact and functioning and allowing blood to circulate through that system. Here again, they're showing us that fine matrix, smooth muscle around the bronchioles that usually dilate during the fight or flight. And then they can constrict based on some medical emergencies but then the breakdown of that oxygen as it goes over these alveoli, the capillary bed where oxygen can be exchanged. So here they're showing us a few areas of where there can be an obstruction, a obstacle or blockage in getting oxygen and getting that oxygenated blood to the cells and tissue. The first blockage here is actually in the windpipe or passageway. This would be something like a foreign body air obstruction. Somebody's choking, which is known as a cafe coronary. Now air can no longer pass down to the lower terminal airway of the alveoli for gas to be exchanged. On the opposite side, we also have the blood that is going out from the right ventricle to be oxygenated by the alveoli, there's an obstruction there. And that is called a pulmonary embolus. So although we have good air exchange from the outside atmospheric, we are unable to get that air and gas to be exchanged and passed over onto the arterial side and then out to the cells. And because we have an obstruction here in the vasculature. So again, this is really important that you understand that the actual passageways can get blocked. One, it could be in the, the conduits that deliver the air and oxygen to the lungs, such as a cafe coronary or foreign body air obstruction. Or in some other cases, it could be even like an asthma attack where the bronchioles are constricted so tightly, air can't get in. Or during the, the vascular side, where blood vessels then carry the blood, there could be an obstruction there called a pulmonary embolus. Again, oxygen is important for aerobic metabolism. We then take that oxygen, which is tightly bound to your red blood cell, and then it's deposited into the cells and tissues. 
that red blood cell will pick up the carbon monoxide, which is transported back to the alveoli to be exchanged and ventilated off. And here we can see the distribution of how blood goes through the system. A previous slide did show us this, that as the arterial side pressure is a higher pressure system, usually that 120 over 80 blood pressure, as it forces through that hydrostatic, that higher pressure causes fluid then to cross over out into the capillaries. Again, we want to have things equal. And if you will imagine again, a type of seesaw and this capillary bed is very level. So what happens then is on the venous side and this venule, we have fluid being drawn back in because of this oncotic pressure. So whatever fluid goes out, we bring some fluid back in to maintain that. Now, if we have an imbalance here, what happens to the, the tissue? He gets swollen. People get swollen and it's called edema. But usually this is imbalance and most of us won't see any type of edema or swelling because this is process is maintaining the circulatory volume. Hydrostatic pressure, this plasma oncotic pressure draws the fluid back in and it returns to the circulatory system and the myocardium. This is showing us the volume. If there's enough volume in that left ventricle to pump out, then we have a normal volume that's ejected. So that's like what's called a stroke volume, the amount of blood that's ejected during one contraction of the left ventricle. That volume that's uh, contracted is called the stroke volume. And if we have a lesser volume, reduced preload, that volume that's not in there, as a result from perhaps maybe shock, hypovolemia, then we have less of a, a stroke volume coming out. So normal stroke volume is about 70 cc's. We will have a range, but in, in normal circumstances, we'll just use 70. And here you can see the effects as far as the contractility. So the squeezing of that left ventricle. If that left ventricle is strong, vibrant, it can contract and empty pretty much 50% of its volume and 70 cc's that is ejected in its normal stroke volume. Here we can see the myocardium, that left ventricle, in its inability, it's unable to really contract and the blood volume that's ejected, that stroke volume, is inadequate. In, well, enough that it won't send enough blood throughout the arteries and arterioles and by the time it gets to the capillaries, it, there's poor exchange there. Here we can see the blood vessel again, the smooth muscle within those arteries, keep it in constant flux and dynamic that we maintain a blood pressure. As you sit down, it may be dilated a little slightly. As you start to move and stand, there's some vasoconstriction and then back to normal. You can see that when this muscle contracts, it changes the lumen or diameter on either end. So the size of that piping, that conduit or blood vessel changes to allow for uh, normal blood pressures and what we call homeostasis. Here's the arterial side going out across to the capillary bed and then back to the venule side, back out to the vein and on one-way valves, large muscular layer on our arteries and arterial rolls. We see that we have sphincters here. What these do when we are in shock, they tend to close down and so that they allow only the passage of blood supply to uh, our, our major organs. So you'll notice that when someone's in shock, their skin turns a pale white color. They also become slightly sweaty or diaphoretic, and then their skin temperature changes, becomes cool. It's a result of these capillary sphincters uh, closing off and shunting blood away from the skin, if you will, at that time, and, and allowing the blood to maintain um, its volume in the arterial side to then disperse its oxygen, nutrients, to the vital organs such as the brain and the heart. So it's very important that they get this. Now, there is some control over di dilation as well as uh, contractility and the speeding up of the heart. And here you can see there's some f uh, function from the brainstem, which is the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve can slow down the heart muscle. 
as far as its contractibility and rate. There is also baroreceptors or pressure receptors that will tell the heart to, you know, uh, slow its, its, its beating down because there's a lot more blood flow. On the opposite side, if we need to increase the heart rate, we would get beta receptors. And again, beta-1 is specific for the heart. Beta-1 comes from adrenaline. Adrenaline comes from the adrenal gland. Adrenal gland sits on top of the kidney. The adrenal gland secretes adrenaline, which is called epinephrine. Epinephrine has a beta-1 receptor, a beta-1 chemical, and the receptor for beta-1 is the heart. It also has beta-2, which is beta-2 is for two lungs, goes to the lungs. It also secretes alpha, and whereas alpha causes arterial constriction. And remember now, adrenal glands not only secrete adrenaline and epinephrine, but it also secretes norepinephrine, which has a lot of alpha stimulant. Here again are those chemoreceptors. So we saw baroreceptors. Those are pressure receptors. Chemoreceptors look at the oxygen, oxygen levels and the carbon dioxide levels. And here you see an hydrogen level. It basically is sensing the chemicals. And when these chemicals are off balance, for example, if oxygen is low and carbon dioxide is high, you bet that it's going to cause the increased rate in the, the breathing apparatus and respiratory rate will increase as well as the amount of air that's going in, which is called the tidal volume. All right, so what we need to also look at is there's also a thing called uh, cardiac output. A cardiac output is an equation. It's an equation of the heart rate, the amount of times that it beats per minute, as well as stroke volume. Now, if you remember the slide that we went over, stroke volume is the amount of blood that the ventricle squeezes out each time it beats. So 70 cc's of blood is ejected from the left ventricle in one beat. Normal heart rate would be 70. So 70 times 70 would give you close to 4,900 or 4.9 liters. That is ejected and circulated throughout the body in about a minute, guys. Now when we think about the respiratory center, then we have what's called a minute volume. Minute volume is the amount of respirations per minute and the tidal volume, the volume that is being inhaled and exhaled in that one breath. And so our usual breaths per minute, we're going to use something like 10. And we would say somewhere about 500 cc's, maybe a normal adult volume. And if you multiply those 10 breaths per minute at 500 cc's, we have 5,000 uh, mLs or five liters and when you look at the cardiac output and minute volume they are almost about equal meaning that the amount of air that goes in gets circulated uh, 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 the oxygenation gets picked up from the red blood cell and it's circulated so our our minute volume and our cardiac output are almost mirrored if you can all right congratulations for sticking this out uh, keep up the studying